Ready when you are. All right, my name is Bob Ellison. Today we're going to be talking about keeping your data safe, how to prevent data loss, uh, loss of your files. I'm the systems architect for the University of Pittsburgh at Bradford, uh, also an adjunct faculty member, and I lead a help desk. So I, I deal with the university's data, I deal with individuals' data, and data loss uh, on a routine basis. Before I get started, I want to point out my website at www.pitt.edu slash tilde ellison. Uh, if you record that and go there and click on the lectures link uh, at the top right, I've got all the links to the various utilities and sites that I'll be talking about today, so you don't have to worry about writing down the, the URLs. This is just the one important URL you should record. You can get everything else from there. I've also got a copy of the uh, slides from the presentation up there as well, if you want to go back through and look at anything. Everybody get a chance to grab that? All right. So I'm going to start with what is data. Uh, you talk about data, some people don't, don't realize what you're talking about. So data can be your Word documents, your Excel spreadsheets uh, that uh, you know, your students are using for homework, you're using for your home budget, those kinds of things. It can be other financial documents, your home movies, your home video collection, your music collection, legal documents, that, you know, if you e-file your taxes, uh, all uh, fall under data and are all uh, potential uh, issues for loss. The value of data. Data by itself doesn't have a value. It's just a series of zeros and ones stored on, on some kind of media. The value is actually imparted by the owner. So what value uh, do you have for that data? You don't possess the data unless you uh, actually have it in more than one location because it can disappear in an instant like that. So you know, you've been have a digital camera, been taking pictures of your kids growing, it up, growing up, storing them on one hard drive on your computer, suffer a, a hard drive loss, you've lost all those memories. The value you place on your data determines how you should uh, protect it, what methods you should take to protect it. Um, you know, some people don't want to put the funds into getting a, a good backup location, but if, if your data is valuable to you, it's worth the investment. So you need to decide, is this just a mere inconvenience uh, if I lose it? Uh, is it just going to take me a little bit of time to re reconstruct it? Um, you know, maybe you'd go with a, a, one of the cheaper uh, backup uh, solutions or not back it up at all. Will you incur some kind of monetary loss? Is this data for a, a home business? Uh, or um, could there be some possible litigation if you lose it? Or is it sentimental or irreplaceable, as I mentioned with your home pictures, your home videos? That stuff you really can't put a dollar amount on, but I know personally if I lost all the photos of my children growing up, I would, um, that would be a great loss for me. So today I'm going to talk about four types of data loss. Uh, the first is deletion, uh, then is uh, file system corruption. I'm going to talk about physical uh, device failure and viruses and malware, how they can cause data loss as well. And we'll start with deletion, and I also include uh, being overwritten here because that happens as well, where you accidentally overwrite a file with another file, not, not realizing it. To prevent this from happening, it's important to store documents in an organized manner. Uh, many times people, you get a new machine, you're trying to do some cleanup, you end up accidentally deleting or forgetting to copy files you need, overwriting files that you need. So your operating system provides you with containers um, that uh, can be used for this organization. So Microsoft Windows, for example, has a My Documents. They've got a My Video. They've got a My Audio. Store the appropriate files in those locations, and then you know where they are. Uh, you can easily retrieve them if you need to move to a new machine. When we talk about backup, you know where to, to look to back them up. Uh, so use those resources. And it, the Apple uh, OS X provides similar containers as well. So use those containers. Uh, you also should uh, re restrict access by using separate accounts if possible. Uh, a lot of home users, you've got your whole family using the computer. Everybody logs in with the same account. Uh, the issue there is you're all using the same containers. If each person had their own individual account, you each get your own individual containers, and you don't have to worry about your son or daughter accidentally deleting or overwriting your files. Uh, these don't have to be password-protected accounts, so if you want to be able to monitor your children's you know, 
usage of the computer, just a blank password, but just by the fact that they're logging with a separate account, that gives them a separate storage location, and you're not competing uh, with one another. You know, for example, if I create a resume, save it on my, my computer, and uh, my wife creates a resume and saves it with the same file name or the top of mine, you know, then I've lost that file and I've got to go through the process of recreating it. So if everybody has their own individual account, prevent that from happening. And you should, uh, with all of these, you should always have at least one additional copy of any data that's important to you. Uh, and we'll talk about means of uh, attaining that uh, coming up. Viruses, malware, malware just being a new term for viruses that infect your computer usually through a web browser. Uh, these may delete files, they may lock the files up, or they may corrupt the operating system, preventing you from getting access to your files. There's a new strain of uh, malware out called ransomware. You may have heard of CryptoLocker in the media recently. Uh, what this virus did is infected your computer and essentially locked up all the files on your computer. So it's essentially like taking all your files, putting them in a safe, locking the safe that you don't have the combination to. And you have to pay the virus author a ransom to get the key to unlock those files and get them back. Uh, I dealt with this on numerous issues uh, out where I work and uh, with some people in the community and, and outlying areas that called in for help. I had students lose resumes, term papers, I uh, had one individual who lost every, she writes articles for media, uh, media sites, she lost every article she'd written for the last 10 years, We're locked up by it. Uh, so this is a, a big one and, and is becoming more because it's profitable. Uh, this, into, uh, the author of uh, CryptoLocker, I believe it was four or $500 he was charging for you to get the key to get your data back. You know, not everybody paid that, but you know, just it only takes a few people to pay that to, to make it profitable. To prevent viruses or malware from causing data loss, it's important to run an antivirus or anti-malware software. There are a lot of these out there. There are free ones, there are pay ones. Um, talking about which you should choose could be a whole other lecture, so I'm not really gonna delve into that. Um, but I advise that you do run one and that you keep the definitions up to date. Um, hopefully in the fall, when we do another presentation, I'll be delving into this in a little more detail. Web browsers and plugins are the most common infection point for computers nowadays, um, and by web browser, I mean things like Firefox, Internet Explorer, Chrome, Safari, Opera, maybe uh, names that you've heard. These are applications you use to browse the, browse the internet. And then the plugins, which are software that add features, functionality to your operating system, things like Java, Flash, Adobe Reader, uh, you may have heard of. Any software has the potential for a security vulnerability and the hacker community out there looks for these vulnerabilities and exploits them. So you may be you know, safely browsing the internet, think you're safely browsing the internet, uh, I have this happen frequently, people searching for recipes. Seems like an inane uh, topic to be looking for. But you click on the, the wrong link, go to a site that has an exploit on it, your machine's now infected. And you can uh, have data loss through that process. So it's important to keep uh, the software up to date at all times. The vendors find the security flaws, they release security patches to prevent these infections from happening. So if you use uh, the Mozilla plugin check, this is a good website to use to uh, check to see if your software is up to date. It'll let you know if the browser you're using is the current version, if there's any security vulnerabilities, and give you a link. Am I in the way of the presentation? And give you a link to uh, retrieve the new, new version. Uh, right from that website. It works best with Mozilla Firefox, but it will work with other browsers too. So you can go there in Safari or Internet Explorer and it'll let you know whether you've got the most current version and where to get, get a more current version. And finally, you want to avoid peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Uh, this has kind of lessened in, in popularity in recent years, but there are still a number of people that use it. Things like LimeWire, uTorrent, um, usually people are using this to download illegal files, you know, uh, uh, copyrighted movies, those kinds of things. The issue with that is the file you're downloading uh, may just be a virus in and of itself. You click on it and run it and infect the computer. Or you may get the movie and watch it and think you're fine, but why it's out there, it's bait. The virus author has actually infected that file so that while you're watching the movie in the background, it's looking for a vulnerability and exploiting it and infecting your machine. So these are all ways that your machine can get infected. 
things that you should avoid. You should also practice safe browsing and email habits. Uh, this is uh, also a common infection point. Uh, you should never open attachment or click a link in an email that you have not specifically requested or that someone hasn't communicated that they're sending to you. Uh, why this is is because hackers and viruses will infect one machine, access the contact list, and send a message to everybody on that contact list saying, you know, look at this cute puppy video or something like that. You click to download the, the file thinking you're just going to watch a video that your friend sent you, come to find out it's a virus distributing itself and you've infected yourself. And you should also avoid sites with questionable content as they often to, uh, attempt to infect your computer. Uh, so pirating sites, other, other sites of uh, questionable content uh, should, should be avoided. And a good tool to uh, prevent uh, access to these sites is OpenDNS at OpenDNS.com. Uh, this takes a little bit of configuring, but there's uh, good instructions on this website to configure your home router. You point your home router to their DNS server, and they have a service where malware sites are reported to them and they block your access to those sites. So if you're just browsing the web, click on a link that actually goes to a site containing malware, it'll pop up a warning and say this site has been reported as malware and preventing you, prevent you from getting access to it. You can also create an account and customize uh, the types of sites uh, you want people to have access to. This takes a, a little more work. You install a client on your machine, and log into the site, and so you can block pornographic websites, social media websites, video sites, um, other things of that nature. There's 20 or 30 different categories that you just check or uncheck, and it prevents uh, access to these sites. So this is also a good one for parents, just keeping their children safe online. And finally, if you do get infected, uh, I recommend the security tango. I point people to this all the time. I actually use it in our workplace to clean machines up. Uh, securitytango.com, and you want to look specifically for the Windows Waltz. If you're running a Windows machine, they do have a cleanup process for the Mac as well. Um, many people think that Mac are safe from viruses. That's simply not true. They can get infected just as easily as, as uh, Windows. They're just not a uh, profitable platform yet, so you don't have as many. Um, but as the user base grows for Macs, the virus um, authors are, are following suit. But if you go to this uh, website, they've got uh, a list of instructions, very, very well-written instructions, and a list of free utilities you can download and go through to clean your machine up and remove a virus. Uh, they call it the Tango because you take two steps forward, one step back. You, you run these utilities several times. It, it is a time-consuming process. I get an infected machine in the office. We usually have it one to two days and are working on it or have scans running on it pr pretty solid for about 10 hours. Uh, to get through the entire cleanup process and make sure a machine is, is clean. Uh, so you do need to dedicate some time, but this is a good source uh, to do cleanup. File system corruption, a third type of data loss. This generally happens due to improper dismounting of the file system. Uh, this can either be that you're unplugging an external device uh, without ejecting it properly, and I'll talk about that in a minute, or if you incur uh, a sudden power loss, uh, especially with desktop machines. Laptops aren't as prone to that because you got the battery in it. If the power goes out, the battery keeps the machine up and running. You can shut it down safely. But if you're, you're using your laptop right to the point that the battery drains, uh, you can run across the same issue. What happens is when you do a normal safe shutdown of your computer, it goes through some maintenance routines uh, to tidy up the file system, make sure all the data is written to it before the, the machine shuts off. If it loses power uh, without going through that process, it's kind of like you're in the process of cleaning up a dirty room and suddenly get uh, interrupted. You come back, you're not sure where stuff is. Uh, the file system has the same problem. It can't identify where to begin to start accessing files. Electrical damage can also cause file system corruption. It can do worse. It can cause failure as well. Uh, but electrostatic discharge, ESD, most people commonly refer to this as static electricity. You walk across the carpet to touch someone else, shock them. Uh, the same thing can happen to your computing equipment. So, uh, you know, you've got a dry environment, especially during the winter. You're handling your external media, or if you're working inside your computer replacing parts, uh, you need to make sure you follow uh, proper ESD practices, make sure you're grounded to the machine, have a hand on the machine at all times so that uh, you're not imposing static charge to these devices. 
Surges, spikes, power issues like that can also cause file system corruption by causing the machine to uh, go down prematurely. To prevent this type of corruption, you want to safely eject external drives before disconnecting. On a Windows machine, down by your clock, there's a little USB logo. You want to click on that and choose safely eject. And then it'll tell you it's safe to eject the system. This does that file system maintenance, tidies everything up, makes sure that there's no files currently being written to the drive, then tells you it's safe to eject, then you can remove the device from the computer. You should utilize a UPS and ensure all devices, including any modems, printers, those kinds of things are plugged into it as well to protect from power loss. Uh, this will prevent uh, file system corruption as well as uh, actual physical damage to the devices in a, a power issue. And in the event of a, an electrical storm, the only truly means of being safe is to have everything unplugged from the wall. So if you've got lightning you know, crashing all around your house, it's best to just unplug everything. And this includes things like your cable modem and, or uh, DSL modem, those, those types of devices, because it'll come in across those as well. So make sure all cables are disconnected from your computer to prevent uh, that type of damage. And always safely shut down the operating system before powering off your computer. I know people have a tendency to get frustrated with their computer, it's not running fast enough. Um, you may just yank the power cord from it or press and hold the power button until it shuts off. That's not a clean shutdown and that can lead to file system corruption. So whenever possible, take the time. You know, I understand that computers do lock up and sometimes that's the only thing you can do uh, is power it off. But whenever possible, make sure you're following a proper safe shutdown procedure. Finally, storage failure. I'm going to talk about three types of uh, physical devices that uh, incur uh, failure and hence data loss. External devices like flash drives, thumb drives, USB drives, they go by various names. Uh, the small little devices that you carry around your pocket to transport files. The physical uh, or mechanical hard drives, as you see in the image here, uh, if you've never seen the inside of a hard drive, there's a, a spinning platter, uh, read write head, looks uh, similar to a record player. Uh, as far as reading and writing the data, scanning across that platter. So you get a lot of moving parts there, and those wear out over time. And we'll talk about that. And then finally, solid state drives. They're uh, the newer technology. They're not prone to the physical wear out, but as they are a new technology, they've got their own issues to be dealt with and to be aware of. So flash drives especially are prone to file system corruption because people just plug them and unplug them from their computer without doing that safe eject process. So make sure you follow that, that process. Uh, broken connectors, as you see in the image on the right here, we've got a flash drive that was broken and that we soldered back together to recover the data from. Uh, the USB connector on the end of the uh, flash drive is uh, very prone to strain, especially if you're, you, your desktop sitting down under your desk, you're plugging your flash drive in down there and you're hitting it, bumping it with your leg. Uh, that weakens those solder points and it can snap right off very easily. So you always want to make sure that you're plugging it straight into the port, not at an angle. Um, and this uh, flash drive on the, uh, the right, I had a coworker, someone brought the, the drive into him, they'd snapped it right off, they'd hit, hit it with their leg or their arm or something and snapped it right off uh, inside the computer. He was able to solder four leads to it and actually recover the data from it. But uh, probably the soldering skills are a little beyond what the, an average home user is, is uh, capable of. And finally, flash drives fail uh, due to failed components. Uh, one of the primary killers of flash drives are washer machines. Those tiny little things, they fit in your pocket, you take your, your pants off, put them in the laundry, and they go through the washer machine, go through the dryer. The big mistake most people make is as soon as they discover it, they immediately plug it into their computer to see if it works. Unfortunately, even though it's gone through the dryer, there's still moisture inside there. You want to make sure it's good and dry before you plug it into a computer. Um, set it up in front of a fan, let a fan blow on it for several days, put it in a bag of rice. Um, just make sure it's dried out very well for several days. You'll have better uh, success at accessing the files and retrieving data on that flash drive. Uh, as you know, water and electricity don't mix. If you've got moisture inside there, you plug it in, it's going to fry, and then all the data is gone. Cheap components. Uh, as with most things, you get what you pay for. You buy a cheap flash drive, they're going to be prone to wearing out sooner. The electrical components just fail over time. Um, so putting a little extra money, uh, if, if the flash drive is important to you, um, will pay off in the long run. And also being constantly connected. 
I see a lot of users that buy a flash drive, they plug it into the computer and they just leave it there. The issue is that there's voltage regulators in that flash drive and they're designed to just be plugged in intermittently when you need to access them. If they're plugged in all the time, they've got voltage going through them all the time and they wear out prematurely. And when they wear out, you lose complete access to all the data on the, on the flash drive. So only have the drive plugged in when you need it. Uh, unplug it and put it in storage somewhere when you're not using it. Finally, mechanical drives. Uh, the failure rates on these drives exhibit what's called a bathtub curve. So you've got high failure rate at the, at the beginning of their lives, usually zero to 18 months. Then the sweet spot, about 18 months to three years, you've got a low failure rate. And then after three years, that's where you start getting uh, physical failures, mechanical failures, because the parts just start wearing out and your failure rate increases. Premature failures are usually due to manufacturing defects. Uh, the manufacturer just did, didn't design something properly. They used a cheap part or have problems with the code of the firmware, the controller that, that operates the hard drive. The mature failures, as I said, are due to mechanical failures. The parts just start wearing out. Um, those of you that are familiar with auto mechanics know that you have to lubricate things, replace parts periodically because they, they wear out over time. Uh, you've got the same issue inside a hard drive, only you can't service that. As uh, the study on the left done by Backblaze uh, shows, you have about an 80% chance of your hard drive lasting three years. But on the flip side of that, you got a 20% chance of a failure. So that's why everybody should, should back up. You don't want to be in that 20% and have your hard drive die and lose your data. And you got a 12% chance of failure for each year thereafter. So in year four, year five, 12% chance each year. So the older the drive gets, the higher the, the chance of failure at that point just because the parts are wearing out. Other causes of me uh, mechanical drive failure are temperature, and contrary to what, what uh, you might think, it's actually cold has a bigger impact on uh, physical drives than, than heat. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're not leaving your computer out during the winter, out in your car. Um, if you got a computer out in a workshop or something that's not heated very well, you may wanna think of the space heater in that general area to help keep the hard drive warm. Uh, the cold uh, has a, a very detrimental effect. And finally, shock. Uh, you have a laptop, you drop it, desktop, you accidentally knock it over, external hard drives. Uh, I know students quite a lot put those in their backpacks, and then you throw your backpack around. Even though that's not plugged in and running, uh, just the fact that it's being off, it, it's incurring a, a shock. The worst thing is for it to experience a shock while it's running, while that platter's spinning. Those of you familiar with record players, um, if you think of a record, you bump the needle, it scratches the record player. Same thing happens inside a hard drive. That platter's spinning, it experiences a shock, that read-write head goes down on the platter and puts a scratch on the platter, and all the data in that location is lost. If it happens too severely, you can lose access to the entire drive. Solid-state drives, these are a newer technology, uh, referred to as SSDs, you may have seen them. Uh, in the media or may, may even uh, have one uh, in a newer computer. These are an immature technology, so they haven't ironed out all the, all the kinks yet. Uh, they exhibit similar premature failures as mechanical drives, but due to different reasons. Uh, usually the controller firmware, uh, the little board on the, the hard drive that controls the reading and writing of the data is the culprit. Uh, the code in there has issues. Many of the controllers on these devices are especially susceptible to power loss. So you wanna make sure in a laptop that the battery doesn't die, in a desktop that you've got a UPS so that the power doesn't go off. Uh, this study done two years ago uh, that I linked to, and again, this uh, is up on my website if you wanna read the full study. But 13 of 15 of the drives tested exhibited some sort of data loss due to power outage, uh, re power removal from the device. And finally, memory cell failure. The way a solid state drive works is, if you think of it as a piece of graph paper or an Excel spreadsheet, you've got different cells that data is written into. Think of each one of those squares as a cell. Each one of those cells can only be written to a limited amount of time. So let's just say it's 10. It's actually a lot higher than that. It's like 10,000 or something. But say it's 10 times. If the first cell is written to 10 times, then that cell is no longer accessible. Depending on the hard drive te technology, the solid state technology, because the first cell is not accessible, any cells thereafter also are not accessible. But even if it's just the one single cell, um, any data in that cell is lost. So these drives uh, employ a technology called trim and wear leveling, in which they distribute the writes uh, across the entire drive uh, to prevent that type of failure. 
However, it's important that uh, in order for this to operate properly, you need to keep at least 10% of your storage available uh, for it to uh, write these bad cells out as they start to fail. If you go above that 10%, it has issues and you can uh, lose data because it can't relocate data in these cells that are wearing out. So preventing failures and corruption of these devices. You should never use external media as a primary storage device. Uh, it's very common among students. They've got their flash drive, they've got their term paper on it, and that's the only copy they have. <clears throat> they come in the day of the, the term papers due, go to plug it in the computer, and the flash drive's no longer accessible, most likely because they just yanked it from the machine the night before. Um, but uh, they lose the data become, because of it. So you should always have a copy on your computer uh, as well as on the flash drive. Flash, flash drives, external devices, are meant for backup and they're meant for transporting files. They're not meant to be a sole storage source. They're very prone, prone to failure. You always want to make sure you safely eject, eject the drive before removing it from the computer, as I said. Um, I, I walked through the uh, Windows side, OS X side. Uh, you click on the icon on your desktop, drag it down to your recycle bin, it'll change to an eject icon, and then tell you it's safe to remove it uh, from the device. Connect the drive in a safe location. So if your machine's sitting down on the floor, having your uh, flash drive plugged into the front of it may not be the safest location because it's prone to being kicked by your leg if you get up out of your chair or whatever. Uh, so I recommend the use of a, what they call a USB extender, which is a USB cable of varying links that you plug into the back of your machine and bring it up onto your desk. And you can plug your uh, device in there uh, where it's out of the way. Also with uh, external hard drives, you want to make sure that they're in a nice stable location where they're not going to be knocked over while they're running. If they tip over while they're running, again, that read rate head is going to crash on the platter, causing damage. And finally, check your pockets. Make sure you don't have external devices in your pockets so that they don't go through the laundry. That's a, a routine I go through every night. <laughs> you want to avoid those sudden bumps or jolts to mechanical hard drives, even just, uh, you know, slamming into your desk um, while um, the drive is running, accessing data can cause damage. Smart technology is a good detection of uh, hard drive failure. It's not 100% foolproof, but it's good to have. And unfortunately, I'm finding more and more vendors are turning it off. So a user has to go in and turn it on. I think they're turning it off because they're trying to uh, squeak the uh, machine through that warranty period, that first year, year and a half warranty that they give. Um, if Smart's employed and it tells you that the hard drive is failing, well, then you're going to call them for warranty replacement. Uh, so they turn this off. How to turn it on varies from computer to computer, but when your machine starts up, it'll say something like press delete, F1, F2 to enter setup. You want to go into that setup program and look for Smart, S-M-A-R-T, uh, which stands for Self-Monitoring Analysis and Reporting Technology. Turn that on, reboot the computer. What this does is monitors your hard drive constantly, and when it starts noticing errors, that the drive's starting having issues accessing data or writing data, it will flag up a warning that, hey, your drive's about to fail. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna fail right away. It could, it could fail right away, or it could run for a year or two, but at least you know that your drive's experiencing errors and you need to get data backed up before it does so. Unfortunately for the Mac users, although the smart technology is there, they don't expose it where the user can see that there's an issue. So there's no real way uh, for Mac users to uh, take advantage of this technology. And as I said, if you're uh, working with the newer solid state drives, make sure you have at least 10% free. So say you have a 120 gig drive, you want, always wanna make sure you've got 12 gig of free space on that drive uh, to prevent any type of uh, corruption. The chart on the left shows in this particular study that 60% of hard drive uh, that failed were detected by SMART. Uh, I've seen uh, other reports as high as 80%. So while it's not foolproof, it's still pretty good. Um, so it helps to have it if it is available to you. These bullet points come from uh, a study by Onsite Logic. And again, I got the link on my website. I don't think it's, uh-oh. Did we freeze up? One moment, please. Let me see if I can. Uh... Technology is great when it works. Can you?
Can you drag that back over to the left screen and put it full screen? There we are. Okay, sorry about that. So given these failure rates, what should a small business or homeowner do uh, to prevent this data loss? Uh, it should be cleared by now. You should always have a backup. You always want at least one extra copy of your data, uh, if not more, depending on its importance. Anytime your data is on a single hard drive, you should have cause to lose sleep uh, if it's important to you. You should never trust backup to a single backup drive. Uh, should always have uh, a local and an offsite backup for anything that uh, has uh, extreme value. Why this is, you know, you could have your computer, have backup going to your local hard drive, and I'll talk about various issues with that, but a good example is a, a fire, if you're unfortunate enough to have a house fire. If all your backups are in your house, well, all your data's gone. So it helps to have that data elsewhere. And there are cloud storage options, and I'll talk about cloud in a minute, uh, that are available between $1 and $2 per gig per year. Uh, providing you backup capabilities. Uh, this copies all your data up, up into the uh, cloud and the internet uh, where you could retrieve it from, from anywhere. It's also important to centralize your data. So if you're running a small business or you know, even just have important uh, data in your house, having the, the important data on one computer, it's easier to back up and manage than having it in multiple locations. As I said, if possible, you should always have an offsite backup uh, via either cloud storage or exchanging backups with a friend, locking the, your backup in a safe deposit box down at the bank, just someplace that's out of your home so that if you do incur some type of natural disaster, uh, you still have access to that data. And it's important to check your backup routinely to make sure it's working properly uh, before you hand that drive off to a friend or, or take it down to the bank or, or wherever you're getting it out of your house, check to make sure that the data is actually there. The worst thing is to go through a failure thinking you've got a, a backup and then go to the backup and find out that it didn't back everything up properly, you're missing files, or it didn't back up at all. Or you've got, you know, a very old version there. Things to consider when selecting your backup method is the value you impart on your data as we discussed. Types of failure you're trying to protect against. Uh, when I go through the various backup methods, I'll, we'll address what, what they'll protect against. And of course, your budget is going to come into play. But again, don't, don't let that be the, the sole decision maker. If, if your data is important to you, it's, it is worth the investment to having some type of backup. Types of backup. Uh, these include cloud-based file storage and cloud-based backup solutions. And what the cloud is, is essentially a bunch of uh, data centers on the internet that your uh, files are copied up to. And these are distributed usually around the world, so you don't have to be concerned with failure of, of one particular location. Uh, most data centers have replicas elsewhere, uh, so these are, are pretty safe methods of, of backing up your data. External hard drive backups, which I'll talk about. Uh, you can also use Windows backup to external devices or Apple Time Machine backups to external devices and I'll go through instructions on configuring those. So cloud-based file storage. This is uh, usually the, the cheapest method. If you just have some home documents, um, you know, small amount of data you need backed up, this is usually a good solution uh, for most people. Uh, I list some various services here like Dropbox, Box, Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive, and I give the default free. Are we not advancing again? Uh, uh, I give the default free space here. Uh, Dropbox give you, gives you two, Box gives you 10, Google Drive gives you 15, and OneDrive gives you seven. But you can pay to get more. So if you, if you need more storage than that, um, you can pay to get a, a subscription and they'll give you more storage. Uh, most of these have apps that perform what's referred to as synchronization for you automatically. So you install the application on your computer, it sets up a particular folder as the synchronization point. Any data that you write into that um, is automatically synchronized up to the cloud. So you open a, a file, change it, save it. As soon as you close that file, it's automatically copied back up, up to the cloud uh, where you've got a safe backup. As I said, most of these are, are free, but you can pay to get more storage. Uh, and you have to store your files in a specific location. You can create subfolders under those to organize things, but you have to put them in the particular location that that application uses. Uh, and this this particular backup may not help with viruses or deletion if the synchronization runs after the corruption occurs. Uh, 
so what I mean by that is if a virus, for example, locks up the file and then it gets synchronized up to the internet, well, now your backed up copy is, is corrupted as well. However, some of these services, you want to look into them. Uh, Box does, Dropbox does, they provide versioning. So you can look at a previous version of the file and recover the old version. So that's the, the simplest um, uh, version of, of getting an off-site backup. If you're looking to invest a little money into it, you've got a lot of data to back up, want to back up your entire computer, you can back up to the cloud. There's various cloud-based uh, backup solutions. So I list a few here, there's a lot more. Uh, Backblaze, Carbonite, CrashPlan, iDrive, Jungle Disk. These are all services. Um, you pay um, around 50 to $60 per year, the ones listed here for a single computer. Uh, multiple PCs, of course, would be more. Pay for the service, install the application on your computer, it runs through a, a quick wizard asking you what you want to back up, and then it handles the backup for you and runs periodic backups up, up to the cloud uh, where your data is nice and secure outside of your home. Backing up to an external hard drive. Um, many external hard drives come with their own backup software that you can install and run. It'll set up a schedule where it does a routine backup. Uh, however, I do recommend at least two drives if you're using an external hard drive as a backup solution. Uh, the reason being, uh, with one drive, you should never keep one drive plugged into your computer all the time because if your computer is hit by a power uh, surge or a virus, that external hard drive can be damaged as well. So not only the data you know, on your computer is damaged, but the external hard drive data gets damaged as well. Uh, so by having two, or two external hard drives, you can alternate them out and always have one sitting someplace else where it's safe from being infected by a virus, safe from a power surge. Uh, and again, preferably that second drive should be somewhere outside of your home. Uh, if you have one drive, the issue there being uh, you should have it unplugged so it doesn't get infected or, or incur a power loss, but then you may forget to plug it back in and run backups. And then if you do have an issue, your backup could be weeks or months old. So uh, having two drives, although a little more costly, is usually safer. Using Windows Backup on Windows 7 to back up a machine. To launch the uh, backup setup, uh, click on the Start button, and in the Search field, if you just type Backup, it'll bring up the Backup and Restore shown in the image at the top. If you click on that, and click on Backup Now, located kind of the right uh, third way down of uh, this particular image. It'll launch a wizard and go through the configuration process for backing up your machine. You, of course, have to have an external hard drive plugged into your machine, and it'll prompt you to select the drive letter of that drive. So in this particular example, the P drive is my backup drive. So I've selected that, and I'm clicking Next. And then it'll ask if you want to let Windows choose what's backed up, or do you want to choose? Um, for the most part, letting Windows choose is fine unless you've got a lot of data, you've got a smaller external hard drive and you've got a lot of data that you don't need backed up, you just want a few things backed up, that's when you do let me choose and you just select the specific folders you want backed up. So for example, if you've got a, a huge movie collection but uh, you know, you've got all the DVDs for it that you can re-rip, you don't have a large hard drive, um, then you can just go in and select just your documents. Uh, but if you just want it to back up everything, uh, as long as you're using those default storage containers, let Windows choose, and you're fine there. If you choose Let Me Choose, it'll present a screen similar to this, where you just put check boxes next to the areas of your computer that you want backed up. Clicking Next, it's going to confirm settings. You click Save Settings and Exit. And now, uh, on a routine schedule that it sets up, uh, it'll run backups, uh, runs a, a full image daily, and then uh, just copies of anything that's changed throughout the week to that external drive. If you have a, a, an error, a file loss, you can then go in and restore the files through the same program. Now OS X uses a program called Time Machine. Uh, on the newer version, OS X Maverick, if you plug the uh, external device in, it'll prompt, do you want to use this device with Time Machine? Um, you just select use as a backup disk. Now, a key thing to note here, if you're a Mac user utilizing Time Machine, is that any data on that drive will be wiped off because it reformats it to a special file system. So you want to make sure you don't have anything important on that external drive before you tell it to use, use it for Time Machine. If you want to work with Time Machine settings, go to Apple and System Preferences and click Time Machine highlighted in the lower right-hand corner of this image. 
and here you can turn Time Machine on or off. And if you click Options in the lower right-hand corner here, you can set up exclusions. So again, if you have folders that you don't want backed up, you can go in and add those, as uh, shown in this image here, uh, to the list of, of areas that shouldn't be backed up. By default, the drive you're backing up to will be added to this exclusion list because you don't want to back up the same drive that you're backing up to or you get into a cyclic loop there. All right, that uh, wraps up my talk. Um, I'm available for questions uh, either now or um, I can hang around a little bit afterwards, but if anybody has questions, we'll open it up for that. Mike? So, Bob, do all of these issues for uh, backing up information and their corruptibility apply the same to iPads, iPods, and cell phones? Um, they're the solid state media. So they fall more under the SSD drives and USB drives. Um, so again, if you're plugging your phone into your computer to sync data or whatever, you should always safely eject it before you um, unplug it from the computer. Are they as prone to the corruptibility? Because like a lot of the viruses and stuff like that, I know some of those are actually in use on cell phones. Yeah, th there's a growing market for, for viruses on cell phones. Um, not as, as wide as uh, computer um, desktop PCs, but again, it's, it's a market thing. Um, as the usage of, of these tablet and phone devices increases, it'll become more profitable and they'll start target, targeting them more. So the... You said something to the data center that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. If they were to compromise your account, yes, they could. That's why it's always important to use a safe password, a secure password. So you want to make sure it's, you know, long. I prefer passwords at least 10, 12 characters long. You use a mix of numbers and letters. Um, the potential is there. Uh, if it's something that's of sensitive nature, I recommend encrypting it before it's put up on the cloud. So that's a, an extra layer of, of security. That's... Mm -hmm. Does it have all these features too? Um, it has Windows backup, yes. Okay. Um, using, using the cloud, again, requires a third party. It needs to be plugged in when the schedule um, is going to occur. Um, I think Time Machine is a little more flexible with that, where it will just detect when the drive's there and back up. Um, but again, if your drive's not, not plugged in for days or weeks, then you, you don't have a backup right. until it's plugged in. Uh, Windows sets up a specific schedule. It runs the backup at 12 p.m. Sunday night. If the drive's not plugged in at that time, then it's not going to back up. Wear and tear on the drive, and again, it's also vulnerable to viruses, just like the internal drive. So do you recommend to unplug your computers and stuff at night? Um, at night, no. Um, using the, the default sleep mode is fine. Uh, that puts everything you know, into a, a kind of an idle state where it's not uh, incurring any, any sort of wear or tear. It depends on how frequently you use it. Um, that's, a, that's a difficult question to ask. Not very often. There, uh, yeah, if you don't use your machine very often, you know, if it's just once a day or once every couple of days, then yeah, shut it down when you're not using it. Um, if, if you're using it multiple times a day, just leave it on and reboot it periodically. Because even, even more so than leaving it on, that initial power on, when you power it on, there's a surge of electricity that goes to all the components, and that's hard on the devices. So if you're turning your computer off and on several times a day, that's hard on the components. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? And again, all of this information is found on your website. Yep, found on my website, www.pit.edu slash tilde ellison. If you want uh, links to any of the uh, utilities or, or uh, services or the studies that I discussed for more information. What's that? Yeah. My contact information is on the website too. If you come across questions, feel free um, to contact me.
I think it's more convenient, um, and you don't have to worry about the physical failures. It, you know, it takes a lot of the worry off you. Um, you know, most of those, they're, you know, you've got your data up there. It's on what's referred to as a RAID array, so it's a, uh, across multiple drives in a computer or server. Usually it's on multiple servers, and most of these have multiple data centers in multiple parts of the country or multiple parts of the world. So the chance of losing the data there is pretty slim. I know there are people that have uh, concerns about people accessing their files, and that's where you would want to use some sort of encryption or, or password protection before it gets uh, put up there. Some of these services provide that capability or you can use a third party. Uh, that's something I'll address in the talk that we do in the fall. Yes. Encryption is like, um, again, it's like locking your files up. It's like putting it in a safe, putting a combination on it that only you know. Password protecting the file, basically. So, you know, only you have the password, no one else can access it. So, for example, I put my budgetary stuff up on Box in the cloud, but that is encrypted with 256-bit encryption uh, with a secure password. So I know that even some, if somebody gets into my account, they can't get into the file because I got to have the password for that too. Flash drive. Um, I got one of those and I took it home because I asked him at Walmart, is this big enough? And he said, oh yeah. And I got there and it wasn't big enough. Yeah, if uh, most flash drives are, are smaller in size unless you're paying a, a lot of money for so them. Paid, it was for 16 gigabytes? Yes, yeah, 16 gig. Enough. In the realm of backup isn't much if, you, if you've got a lot of data. Um, you're better off with an external hard drive that's either 500 gig or a terabyte in size because uh, you're going to want multiple instances of your files. Uh, Windows Backup usually is, is good about managing the free space on, on the drive. Um, you know, you can go in and customize how many versions of the files you want to keep. Um, That's what I had to do. Yeah, so you reduce the number of versions being kept and, and that'll, that'll free up space. But you know, usually you want a larger external drive. An external? An actual external hard drive. Okay. Not a, not a USB flash drive, not one of the little, little connectors, but one of the bigger square ones. It does an initial backup where it backs everything up, and then it just backs up anything that changes from that point on. Okay. So if a file changes on Monday, file changes on Tuesday, um, you can have multiple copies. Okay. So it doesn't rewrite it over to Tuesday's copy. So right. Now, when it gets back around to Sunday, then it does a complete image again, okay. overwriting everything that it did Monday through Saturday. Okay. But you know, during the week, it, it, you know, it does a, a full copy one day, and then it just does what they refer to as a differential or incremental, just the files that have changed the rest of the week. Okay. So once a week, you're looking at it, it does a complete yes. write-over. Yep. Time machine, it just does a copy, and then just does essentially changes after that. Yeah, and it's important that you know when it's occurring and know that your machine's on. Right. Um, it, can, it can be asleep and it, it'll wake itself up to do the backup, but you want to make sure it's at least powered on so that it can run those backups. Do you, when it comes to this um, external hard drive, do you recommend the ones that are um, independently powered or the ones that are um, powered by the plug-in computer? By the USB? Um, usually the ones that are indep independently powered are a little faster. Um, if you're concerned with speed, it would be the only difference. The ones powered off a of USB can only draw so much power, and so they're usually a little slower. But if, you know, for backup purposes, it, it doesn't matter. And for the average consumer going up to the store, do you have a recommended uh, brand you look for? Or are there better quality? Um, no, it varies, <laughs> varies from... Uh, Hard drives are, are a difficult uh, thing to, to point out as, as uh, one vendor being another. Because this year, um, you know, uh, for example, I was looking at a study where Hitachi uh, has the lowest failure rates. Unfortunately, Hitachi sold their entire hard drive market to two other companies. Uh, 
That's what they're, they're so you can't get Hitachi drives anymore. Um, back in the 90s, Western Digital drives failed a lot. And now I'm seeing a lot of Seagate drives failing a lot. Um, so, it, and it's not so much the manufacturer of the external drive, you wanna know what's in that external drive, who the manufacturer of the actual drive inside that little container is. Um, but those vary from year to year, you know. All manufacturers have issues with manufacturing processes, and you can get a bad run of drives and, and have failures. Um, Anything to watch for there? Anything specific to look for? Um, not really, no. Um, again, it, it's just using it safely and watching for, for issues. You know, if it starts prompting, you know, a uh, classic sign, if you plug an external drive in and it's, it pops up and, and wants to run check disk on the drive, that means the file system is starting to become corrupted uh, and you want to um, let it run the check disk immediately and, and correct that issue and stop doing whatever caused the uh, corruption. You know, make sure that you're dismounting it properly before you remove it from the drive. That's a, a classic telltale sign. Um, for backup purposes, defrag, the only thing defrag is going to do for backup purposes is it may speed up the backup process. If, if the backup's taking forever, um, running a defrag may speed that up, but that's not really going to help the health of the drive. Uh, a check disk, I use a utility called Spinrite, which I'm going to put a link to that up on, on my website. I somehow I overlooked that, but that's a, a hard drive diagnostic utility for internal drives. Uh, currently, it only works on PCs. It doesn't work on Macs, but that'll go through and it can be used to recover data as well as just kind of put your hard drive through a health safety check uh, just to make sure that everything's operating properly. Uh, using that uh, once a quarter, um, you know, once every three months or so, probably a, a good thing. Same as disk cleanup? Disk cleanup, no, that just frees up space on your hard drive. Uh, but if. Uh, in, That sounds like a third-party application. That's not a, a native Windows. I'm not familiar with that. Oh, the. Uh, this, yeah, Dell has a system update utility they put on their application. That gives you the newest drivers and that kind of thing. Um, usually you don't have to worry about like viruses, infections through that. Um, is it possible for the, for the file to get corrupted while you're downloading it? Yeah, that can happen. But it'll, it should detect that and re-download the file if that were to occur. For cleaning up free space, you mean? Uh, Windows has a, an integrated disk cleanup. If you right click on the hard drive and go to properties uh, and click on tools, there's a disk cleanup button that you can click on and it cleans up temp files um, and looks for log files, those kinds of things. Third parties give you more functionality, more bells and whistles, but you know, if, if you're just looking to free up uh, drive space. I mean, it runs usually once a week, I have that set. Yeah, I mean, if you have it, that's, that's not a problem, but personally, I wouldn't go out and purchase one because Windows has that, that capability built in. Yeah. Is that the same thing on a Mac as the disk utility function? The disk utility is more for diagnosing errors. Um, I'm not familiar with it doing cleanup, like freeing up drive space. And the diagnosing errors sound to me like bad cells. Right, looking for bad sectors, bad cells on the drive, or file system corruption. Yeah, it goes through and uh, looks through the file system. Um, think of the file system as like an index in the back of a book um, with pointers to where the files are actually located. And what happens is that particular entry gets scratched over and so it doesn't know where to find the file. And it goes through and physically finds the file and writes that entry back into the index so it knows where to locate it again in the future. So it basically just kind of updates, does, the, does the, the housekeeping to tidy itself up so it knows where to locate things. No. It does do like a right, it's operating at a logical level. Yeah, if, if, a, if a drive is physically failing, there's really not much you can do. 
If, if data is really important to you, you can send it away to a data recovery company and they can recover it, but you're talking $1,000 right out of the box just for them to look at it. And then more for the recovery process. Any electrical um, component should be recycled. Now, if you're concerned about the data on it first, I would destroy it um, before sending it for recycling. Um, that can be done one of two ways. Uh, there's a utility called uh, Derek's Boot and Nuke, and I can put a link to that up on my website as well. The Derek's Boot and Nuke, if the, if the drive is still accessible, um, it's just old, too small, or something like that, you boot off this CD, and it does a DOD, a Department of Defense wipe. Um, three or seven times, depending on the settings you choose, where it just writes over the drive repeatedly with random information so that someone can't go back with a file recovery utility and recover your data. If it is not accessible, um, but you're still concerned about the data that's on it, I tear it apart. Um, open up the enclosure, open up the drive. Usually that requires some security um, bits, but you can, I've gotten them down here at uh, Worth uh, W. Smith. Um, to have the right bit to open it up, but open it up and just smack the platters with a hammer um, and then send it away to be recycled. So even though you can't access it because it's been quote unquote corrupted or it's just old and not working or anything like that, are there folks that are able to access There is the potential. Like I said, data recovery uh, services um, have the capability of getting at, at those. So if a drive is inaccessible, it can be inaccessible for a number of reasons. One of those is the little uh, uh, board on the back side of the, the hard drive that kind of controls access to the drive. If that, dr that board fails, um, yeah, you can't access the data, but the data is still on your platter. If you have an identical drive, you can take the board off at the identical drive sometimes, mount it to the hard drive, and then get at the data. So there, there are, are means of still getting at the data. Yeah, usually they melt it or, or grind it down. Okay. Uh, similar to a flash drive going to a washing machine, if, if someone throws an old external hard drive in the garbage and it goes to the, the dump, the weather is going to get it. Right? There's a good chance that the data won't be recoverable, but you know, if someone intercepts the drive on the way to the dump, right. you know. Right. I, we, we put hard drives or computers out for recycling at Pitt all the time but always make sure every hard drive that goes out there is DOD wiped before it goes out because we have students that come and pillage them for parts and whatnot, and I don't want the data getting out, so it's always, it's always securely wiped or um, we sometimes physically destroy the drives depending on the sensitivity of the, the data. For backing up to an external drive, I don't think so. I think Time Machine and, and Windows Backup are fine. Again, the, there are ones you can purchase that give you extra bells and whistles. If you're looking for those bells and whistles, then fine. But if you're just looking for a copy of your data, what comes with the operating system is fine. Okay. And Windows Backup, they're backing up everything. I mean, you get your photos, your... Software. Yeah, unless you customize it. Uh, if you let it choose, I don't believe so. If you want a full backup of the computer, you want to do a custom and select the entire computer. Okay, so it, it would keep your files and stuff like that, but like you'd lose Microsoft Word, you would lose right. and have to reinstall. You'd have to reinstall those. Okay. If you, you know, if you want to back that stuff up, again, it takes more space, but you can do so. Back to the external hard drive, like I told you, I went to Wally's over the last week for Mesa. Mm -hmm. Yep. Do they have that type of external hard drive? I mean, if I go up there and say, I need an external hard drive, does that yeah. mean I just don't know what I need? Yep. Yeah, tell them you want an external hard drive, not a flash drive. Or not a flash drive. Yep. Okay. 
and you're looking some, for something probably at least 500 gigabytes. Yeah, a, a flash, flash drives. Um, the ones you get at Walmart usually are like 16 gigs, maybe 32 gigs. They can yeah. come as big as 128 or 256, yeah, exactly. but you're going to pay, pay uh, pretty well for those. Yeah, and you can get more storage space on an external hard drive, usually for less money. So 500 gigabytes or more. Right. And again, that, that depends on the, the size of your internal hard drive and how much data you have. Um, you know, if you're doing a lot of video editing and that kind of stuff, you may want two, three terabytes of, of storage to back that stuff up. Uh, but for the average home user that just has some pictures, some home videos, usually a one terabyte drive will be fine. A terabyte is a thousand gigs. It's ten hundred twenty-four gigs. So for a gig, how many pictures is in a gig? In a gig? How many songs? Gonna make me do some uh, calculations. So an average picture varies between. It can vary from like thirty-four k to maybe half a meg. So there's ten hundred and twenty-four meg in a gig. So you're talking at least two thousand pictures in a gig, probably three thousand. MP3s are usually a couple of meg, so you're talking maybe 300 songs in a gig. All right. That's just a one gig. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, you know, videos are usually larger. Um, you know, if I were to take this video right now, it's about an hour long, rip it, that's usually going to be between 500 and 700 megs. So you only get maybe one or two videos per gig of, of storage. Usually relatively small, yeah, 100K, 200K sometimes. So again, you're talking two, three thousand per, per gig. Anybody have any other questions? All right, thank you so much. I think you're welcome. You a lot. All right, and again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. At the bottom of my website, there's contact links. Click on the email link and, and send me an email if you have questions. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Oh, nice to meet you. I've, I've heard about you.